Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to continue our read through of the Atlas Obscura, which is one of your guys' favorites apparently, and it's one of mine. Um, if there's a series that you really like that's, you know, any of my other books, just let me know in the comments because I have fun reading all of them, but this one's really really enthralling, I think. So tonight we're going to read about Scandinavia. We're going to read about Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. I've got my pencil bookmarked in here so I can get right to it. Let me set that down quietly and let's get started in Denmark. And apologies for any mispronunciations. I don't speak any of these languages, so if I get something completely wrong, feel free to correct me in the comments. So, like I said, starting in Denmark, we're going to the Rubjerg Nude Lighthouse in Loken Hjoring. I, I hope that was close to what it actually is. Anyway, the Rubjerg Nude Lighthouse is slowly being swallowed by its surroundings. Built just off the North Sea in 1900, the 75-foot tower is now half buried in sand, the result of coastal erosion, wind, and shifting dunes. For a few decades, the lighthouse keepers fought against the encroachment. They planted a perimeter of trees and shoveled sand from the courtyard, but it was a losing battle. More sand blew in, hampering views of the sea and forcing the lighthouse to cease operations in 1968. The tower and its surrounding buildings stayed open as a museum and coffee shop until 2002, when the growing dunes threatened to overwhelm the entire operation. All five of the surrounding buildings are now smothered in sand. The lighthouse, too, will soon be blotted out by the forces of nature, the site is now open for just a few weeks in the summer. Wow. And moving on to the Rundetorn in Copenhagen. Danish for round tower, Rundetorn is a cylindrical building topped with a dome that contains Europe's oldest functioning observatory. Built in 1642, the year of Galileo's death, under the orders of King Christian IV, the tower originally contained a planetarium showing two versions of the solar system, the Galileo-approved heliocentric model and the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe's geocentric interpretation. Rudetorn is notable for its internal architecture. It contains no stairs, just a spiral brick path that winds around a central column seven and a half times. The unusual design has a practical purpose. Large, heavy, scientific instruments needed to be transported to the top of the tower, and wagons made the job a lot easier. The Rundetorn Observatory operated in conjunction with the University of Copenhagen until 1861, when it was replaced by the new Osterwald Observatory, built on the outskirts of town to avoid light pollution. Rundetorn is now open to the public for stargazing and sightseeing. The tower is also the site of an annual spring unicycle race in which riders pedal up and down the spiral. The current record, set in 1988, is 1 minute 48.7 seconds. Wow, it's pretty fast. Next, it's Toland Man in Silkborg, central Denmark. Oh dear, look at this one. Walking around the Bjartskovdal bog in 1950, brothers Emil and Vigo Hogyard, along with Greta, Vigo's wife, stumbled upon a body. Believing the man to be a victim of a recent killing, they called the police. Further investigations revealed that he had indeed been murdered some 2,300 years earlier. The Toland man was found curled in a fetal position with his eyes closed and a serene expression frozen on his face. The cold, acidic, oxygen-starved conditions of the peat bog had kept him remarkably well-preserved. His hair, beard stubble, eyelashes, and toenails were all intact, and he was nude but for a sheepskin cap and wide belt around his waist. 
A rope was wound tightly around his neck. The Iron Age man had been hanged, likely during a ritual sacrifice. In 1950, it was not yet known how best to preserve discoveries like Toland Man. Accordingly, only the head of the original specimen was kept intact. The rest of the body was subjugated to various tests to determine his probable age, probably around 40 due to the presence of wisdom teeth and wrinkles and the conditions surrounding his life and death. Among the details found, Toland Man was 5 feet 3 inches or 1.6 meters tall. His final meal was a gruel made from barley and flaxseed, and his sacrificers, or killers, took the time to close his mouth and eyes after death. Thousands of bog bodies have been discovered in, Sar in sphagnum swamps across northern Europe, but the Toland man remains the best preserved. His original head and reconstructed body now reside at the Silkborg Museum. The rope used to end his life is still wrapped around his throat. Moving on to Finland, we're at Tree Mountain in Yolarvi, Pirkanma. This conical tree-covered hill was not created by nature. It's a planned work of art that was 14 years in the making. Artist Agnes Dennis first proposed Tree Mountain, a human-made forest on a human-made hill in 1982. Ten years later, the Finnish government announced that it had approved the project. From 1992 to 1996, 11,000 people each planted a tree on a specially sculpted mound of dirt. Together, the trees form an intricate pattern derived from a combination of the golden ratio and Dinesh's own pineapple-inspired design. Each tree belongs to the person who planted it and their descendants. The site is legally protected for 400 years. And moving on to Iceland. We're at the Iceland Phallological Museum in Reykjavik. We're obviously going to be talking about people's nether regions here, so if that's a sensitive topic, I apologize, but anyway. Sigurdur Hjartason began collecting phallic specimens in the 1970s, beginning with a pizzle, a whip made from a bull penis. Since then, his phallic collection has grown to enormous proportions. The museum aims not merely to titillate, but to advance the ancient science of philology which examines how male genitalia have influenced history, art, psychology, and literature. Devoted to the study and appreciation of mammalian penises, its 280 specimens are drawn from a wide range of animals, including polar bears, badgers, cats, goats, seals, and even a blue whale, whose daunting 5 foot 7 inch member is the largest in the collection. The museum also oversees a small collection of homo sapien specimens, courtesy of men who bequeathed their genitals to the museum. One of the donors, an American, made a cast of his penis, which he dubbed Elmo, to be kept in the museum until the real item could be donated. Another, a 95-year-old man from Iceland, decided to contribute his penis so that it might be preserved as an eternal totem of his my many youthful indiscretions. In addition to biological specimens, the museum also features phallic artwork and objects. Following their silver medal win at the 2008 Summer Olympics, 15 members of Iceland's handball team provided casts of their penises. They are painted silver and displayed in a row behind glass, the phallic equivalent of being featured on a cereal box like that. Next we have the Arctic Henge in Raufarofen. Oh, that's beautiful. Located in one of Iceland's most remote northern villages, the Arctic Henge is a colossal piece of stone construction that, when finished, will make Stonehenge look like amateur hours. Started in 1996, the Arctic Henge project is a monument not only to the country's Nordic roots, but also to some of the neo-pagan beliefs that have arisen in certain areas. The piece was inspired by the Eddic poem Voluspa, or Prophecy of the Cirrus, taking it from the concept of 72 dwarves who represent the seasons in the world of the poem. 
the Arctic Henge, 72 small blocks, each inscribed with a specific dwarven name, will eventually circle four larger stone monuments, which in turn will surround a central balanced column of massive basalt blocks. Each aspect of the deliberate layout corresponds to some aspect of ancient Norse belief, and when each piece of the monument is installed, visitors will be able to capture the midnight sun by viewing it through the various formations at different vantage points depending on the season. So far, only the imposing central tri-column and one of the four larger gates have been constructed, along with a smattering of the smaller stones. Moving on, that's beautiful, but next we're talking about the Necropants in Holm, Holmavik. Holmavik. Some might say it's unseemly to exhume the corpse of a departed friend, flay his skin in one piece from the waist down, and wear that flesh as a pair of leggings. These people do not know about the rich tradition of Necropants, a wealth attracting good luck garment. According to the Museum of Icelandic Sorcery and Witchcraft, necropants were a real thing in 17th century Iceland. The rules were complex. First, you had to get permission from a living man to use his skin after he died. When he kicked the bucket, he would wait around for the burial formalities to conclude, then approach the grave and start digging. The corpse exhumed, you cut around the waist and peeled the skin from the bottom half of the body making sure to keep it all in one piece. The next step was to steal a coin from a poor widow. This coin was placed into the scrotum of the necropants, where it would magically attract more money, leaving the wearer with a groin full of coins at all times. Once you'd had enough of the great wealth, or the necropants began to chafe, you would have to find another wearer to step into the magical leggings. In this way, the prosperity was passed down for generations. A pair of necropants is on view at the museum in a softly lit alcove standing on a bed of coins. Oh, Iceland. Next is Svartafoss. In this place, let's, let me attempt. Kirkjubeyar Gloucester. Skaftar Ripper. Svartafoss, meaning Black Fall is a modest waterfall in terms of height, width, and force, but its backdrop of black hexagonal columns makes for a rare and splendid sight. The columns are basalt crystals formed from lava flows that cooled over centuries, the same process that created the textured walls of Fingal's Cave in Scotland. Parts of the crystals often break off and plunge into the river, so mind the sharp rocks at the base of the falls. It's really beautiful. And next we have, let me attempt this one, it's, um, Trignukagagr Volcano in Blue Mountains County Park in Bialfu. Volcanoes are usually best admired from a safe distance, but Iceland's Trignukagagr is so geologically unique, it is possible to go right inside the heart of the volcano. The three calderas of Thrynukagiger have lain dormant for so long. The last eruption was over 4,000 years ago. Brave visitors can actually descend into the volcano's colorful magma chamber. An open elevator takes you over 600 feet down into the depths of the enormous crater, which is so large it could fit the Statue of Liberty in its entirety. Inside the cavern, you're met with a surreal sight. Rather than the jet black obsidian you might expect, the craggy walls are covered in a gleaming pearlescent rainbow of color that almost makes the cave look like it's composed purely of gems. This is the only place on Earth where you can take a cable lift into the heart of a volcano, thanks to a strange natural phenomenon. Usually, after an eruption, the roiling magma cools and solidifies in place, effectively plugging the opening. But somehow, the fathoms of magma that once boiled inside one of Thrignuka Geiger's peaks sank back down into the earth, leaving behind a massive open cavern. That is so beautiful. That would be something to see, wouldn't it? Next, we have the 
Icelandic Elf School in Reykjavik. When Icelandic Member of Parliament Arne Jonsson escaped unharmed from a car crash in 2010, he knew whom to credit for his survival. Elves. After rolling five times, the politician's SUV came to rest beside a 30-ton boulder. Jonsson, believing that multiple generations of elves called that boulder home, concluded that they used their magic to save him. When roadwork later required the removal of the boulder, he claimed it for himself, transporting it to his home to ensure the elves would continue to watch over him. Jonsson's beliefs are not unusual. According to Icelandic folklore, thousands of elves, fairies, dwarves, and gnomes, collectively known as hidden people, live in rocks and trees throughout the country. It is no wonder, then, that the world's only elf school is located in Reykjavik. Hmm, historian Magnus Skarfethinsen, who has spent decades documenting people's encounters with elves, established the school in 1991. Classes focus on the distinguishing characteristics of Iceland's 13 varieties of hidden people. The school also offers five-hour classes for travelers, which include a tour of Reykjavik's elf habitats. Students receive a diploma in hidden people research. Skarja Thinsen has never seen an elf. His knowledge of their appearance and behavior comes from the hundreds of testimonies he has collected from people who claim to have made contact with hidden people. Though Skarfinthinsen has devoted 30 years to the subject and considers himself the foremost authority on elves, he maintains a sense of humor about it all. At the end of class, he serves homemade coffee and pancakes and tells stories about the people who come up to him to say, I swear I'm not on drugs, but I saw the strangest thing. <laughs> Next, we're going to Norway. I need to adjust my headphones. They're slipping off my head. There we go. Okay. The Svalbard Global Seed Vault in Long Yerbin, Svalbard. A winter night in Long Yerbin lasts four months. In the ice-covered mountains, the darkness is broken only by a slim concrete building that emits a pale blue glow as it overlooks the 1,000 resident town. The simple structure offers no hint as to what's protected inside, a collection of seeds that could save humanity. Due to a loss of genetic diversity among commercially cultivated crops, which tend to be grown from clonal monocultures, many worldwide food crops are at risk of disease. Mutated strains of fungus or a new bacterium could potentially wipe out an entire world crop in a matter of months, causing massive food shortages. The Svalbard Global Seed Vault was established by the Norwegian government in 2008 to function as a sort of genetic safe deposit box. The facility has the capacity to conserve 4.5 million seed samples. Under the current temperature conditions in the vault, which are similar to those in a kitchen freezer, the seed samples can remain viable to begin new crops for anywhere from 2,000 to 20,000 years. Svalbard was chosen as the location because it is tectonically stable and its permafrost provides natural refrigeration in case of a power failure. There is no permanent staff at the seed bank, but it is monitored constantly using electronic surveillance. Access to the vaults, open only to employees, requires passing four locked doors protected by coded access keys. And next is the Kierak Bolson. Look at that. In Forsand, Rogaland. Kierak Bolson is a boulder wedged in a mountain crevasse, 3,228 feet above the ground. It is a favorite spot for base jumpers, who hurl themselves from the cliff toward the spectac spectacular fjord below. My accent slipped out there for a second. Spectacular. Not spectacular. Visitors without vertigo are welcome to step onto the boulder for a unique photo opportunity. There are no fences restricting access. I could never. I'm so scared of fences. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll try to do a video with my actual voice. But I don't know. I don't think my real accent's very tingly. But anyway. We're at the Emanuel Vigland Museum in Oslo. 
brother to the more celebrated Gustav Vigeland, whose eccentric sculptures occupy a prominent park in central Oslo, Emanuel Vigeland will be remembered through his own strange and enchanting artistic work. The Emanuel Vigeland Museum serves double duty as a mausoleum designed and decorated by Vigeland himself. Visitors enter the building by stooping through a heavy, low iron door. Inside, a large, darkened, barrel-vaulted room is completely covered with paintings that show human life from conception to death in explicitly erotic scenes. The 8,611 square foot fresco took Vigeland 20 years to finish. Entering the mausoleum is a solemn, even haunting experience. Even the quietest footstep echoes across the barrel vaulted ceiling for up to 14 seconds. A flashlight is needed to reveal the room's dark, painted walls. Vigeland began construction on the building in 1926, with the intention of later filling it with his paintings and sculptures. Only one wall and the ceiling of the barrel-vaulted room were to be covered by paintings. The rest would be left bare to showcase other works. When Vigeland decided that the museum should also serve as his mausoleum, he had the windows sealed with bricks, lending the entire building an eerie atmosphere. He completed the fresco, finding inspiration in the burial chambers of antiquity and drawing, cha and drawing especially from the dramatic stories of creation and original sin from Christianity. Named Vita, or Life, the fresco focuses on humanity's sexual instinct portrayed by naked bodies captured in an impressive array of intimate acts. After Vigeland's death, his ashes were put to rest in an urn that sits above the main entrance. Now run by a private foundation, the museum was opened to the public in 1959, more than a decade after Vigeland's death. Today, the museum is open for only a few hours each week, but a place hosts to several concerts, sometimes involving didgeridoos, throughout the year. Alright, off to Sweden, to the Iturbi Mine in Stockholm. Yitterby. Yitterby. Army lieutenant and part-time chemist Carl Axel Arrhenius was excited when, in 1787, he came across a strange heavy black rock in an old quarry near the Swedish village of Yitterby. Arrhenius named the newly discovered substance, because elements were not yet recognized, Yitterbite, after the town. A plaque now marks the site. Also present in the quarry was a crude mineral called yttria, which was the oxidized form of yttrium. Silver yttria contained four rare silvery white elements, ytterbium, now used in electrodes and lasers, terbium, used to make microprocessor chips, erbium, used for medical lasers, and yttrium, used to make phosphors for LEDs, making the site the single richest source of elemental discoveries in the world, and giving the town of Itterby an outsized presence on the periodic table. Next is the Sweden solar system in Stockholm. Created at a scale of 1 to 20 million, this country-spanning model is the world's largest representation of the solar system. It is anchored by Stockholm's spherical globe arena building, which represents the sun. The inner planets, all appropriately scaled, are dotted around Stockholm and its suburbs. Further north are Pluto, still part of the lineup despite its 2006 reclassification as a dwarf planet, and fellow trans-Neptunian objects Ixion, Sedna, and Eris. A plaque in Sweden's northernmost city of Kiruna, 592 miles away, marks the spot for a termination shock point at which solar wind slows down and causes changes in the magnetic field. In 2011, vandals snatched Uranus from the town of Galva, 100 miles from Stockholm. But in October 2012, a new model of Uranus appeared a few miles south in the village of Lofstebrook. The planet's new location reflects its orbit position when closest to the sun, so the solar system model is still accurate. Isn't that where that goat is burned every year. Well, burned by like vandals. Kind of makes sense that it would still be from that. Anyway. 
The last place we're going to explore tonight in Sweden is the Lund University Nose Collection in Lund, Scania. The 100 Strong Nose Collection at Lund University contains plaster casts of some notable Scandinavian snouts, including a cast of the metal prosthetic famed Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe wore after losing the bridge of his nose during a sword duel. That's like an astronomy fact that every, like, astronomy person knows that Tycho Brahe wore a fake nose. But anyway, that's going to be it for tonight. So when we continue this book, we'll head into Asia and read about the Middle East. So thank you so much for watching. Look at this cool cover. Let curiosity be your compass. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night. Good night. Good night. Ooh, loud car. Good night, good night.